I'd like to begin the day by introducing our first session titled Emergency Preparedness, Natural and Unnatural Disasters, Are You Ready? If you have followed the news over the past few months, one thing is very clear, emergencies and disasters can strike at any moment. And when those moments happen, it's important for patients, care partners, and families to have a plan in place that was developed far in advance. Patients and families should feel confident in asking their care facility what emergency preparedness plan and procedures they have developed to keep patients safe and supported throughout an emergency situation. And patients need to have their own plan in place whenever disaster strikes. Taking us through this important topic are two members of AAKP's executive leadership team who are not only patients themselves, but who also have led major national and state emergency preparation response efforts. Joining us are AAKP President Ed Hickey, a U.S. Marine Corps veteran who served as the Senior Advisor for Homeland Security for the Director of Office of Personnel Management, the head of the federal government workforce, and AAKP's Chair of Policy and Global Affairs, Paul Conway, who was the former Interim Director and Chief of Staff for the U.S. Department of Homeland Security of Gulf Coast Rebuilding in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, William, and Gustav. Together, these two professionals have been involved in the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, staffing for U.S. aviation security, and the response to multiple national disasters across the nation. Paul and Ed recently wrote an interesting editorial on how inclement weather impacts dialysis care across the nation. And we have added that link um, to the platform as a resource for you to use and share with your local first responders. And we encourage you to do so. Now, gentlemen, I turn it over to you. Good morning. My name is Ed Hickey, and I'm the president of AKP. I'm joined here by my good friend, Paul Conway. And today we're going to go over emergency preparedness and, and things that you should consider when a natural disaster strikes and make sure that you're ready to protect yourself and your family. So today we're going to cover a number of objectives and hopefully you'll be able to take away some of the information that we share. What we hope to accomplish is that you will know the various types of scenarios that may pose an emergency threat in what context they may occur and how to prepare for them. You'll come away with an understanding of the key questions you and your care team should ask today about existing emergency plans for continuity of care. You'll learn what preparations can be made to fill gaps in existing institutional and personal emergency plans to increase resiliency before an emergency develops. And you'll walk away hopefully armed with yourself and your care teams with expert resources that can be used anytime. So emergency planning moves from a static activity to a more dynamic process that anticipates emerging threats and makes better use of past lessons, new tactics, and technologies. What we have to do is change everyone's mindset about what needs to occur before an emergency during an emergency and after an emergency. You have to change everyone's mindset about what will go on. Know the thoughts and sounds of emergency response failure before disaster strikes, and that's critical. We can't emphasize that enough. The better prepared you are, the better result you'll have because during an emergency, everything is fluid. Nothing will go according to plan, but at least you'll have something in place that you can fall back on that will help you deal with the disaster when it strikes. And some of the, uh, the things that we hear often are that it, it can happen here, that this, this event is not going to happen here, whether it's an earthquake, a fire, a flood, it's a denial that it can happen here. Uh, another, another statement that we, we hear frequently is that I was hired a year ago and I never knew we had a plan. And that's absolutely after the fact and after the fact is way too late. And then another statement that we hear is there, we're really close to a fire station or the emergency responders will be here. It's right up the street. Well, when a disaster hits, 
they have their own plans in place and they follow those protocols and they train every every week, every month on, on what it is they're supposed to do. And you have to make sure that you're at least incorporated in some way into that plan and don't just assume that uh, you'll be taken care of because of your proximity to the fire station. Because when you go up to the fire station in the emergency, it's going to be empty because they're going to be out doing something. And this, this one, I'm sure most of you can relate to is we have a plan. It's in the bookcase where we're all set. And you go back and look at the plan and it was from 1975 and it, it has a couple of additions that were slipped in in 2001 and 2004. And that's the last time anybody's looked at it. it it's got a lot of dust on it, but its usefulness isn't that great because a lot of the information is dated. The contact information is certainly outdated and you want to make sure that you have the most current plan on your shelf. You go into a situation and you say, someone else manages that issue. That's not my responsibility. Well, your care and emergency is your responsibility. You're your best advocate. You know what your needs are. And once you know the resources to, uh, to help you get the continuity of care that you need, you'll be able to uh, at least start executing on what those plans are. So make, make sure that you know it's your job to take care of yourself. And it's others' responsibility as well, but you're the primary re person responsible. Sometimes the, uh, the, the managers of, of disaster responses just say, patients don't get it. They don't understand what the response should be. And so if something happens, I'll take care of it. Well, you, you again have to advocate for yourself and you have to make sure that people understand what it is that needs to happen and that there's someone that understands your particular circumstances. Because for instance, they're, they're, they may not nece necessarily be aware of the needs of a dialysis patient and what goes into getting you to the dialysis center or getting you to a, a site that's dialyzing at that moment and, and what factors into that. And then uh, also a, a, a yearly uh, refresher, an update on what needs to be done. Well, people think that it's it's in their minds because it all, they only did it a year ago and then one year turns to two and two turns to three and there's a lot of turnover and, and memories are what memories are. And you, you have to make sure that you're current on your emergency plan. So Paul, I'll turn it over to you for the next slide. Great, thanks a million, Ed. So on this next slide, uh, is the fact that you need to be prepared for any type of eventuality. And some of them are ones that more readily come to mind or even in the newspapers. Take a look here in the column under natural. So earthquakes, wildfires, extreme temperatures, we've seen those uh, throughout this past summer, landslides, famines and drought, hurricanes, tornadoes, extreme participation in flooding. Over the past six or seven months, we've seen incidents of so many of these things here in the United States. But the other category of things are those that are not that often in the newspaper, but can happen, as we well know. Unnatural events. You can have foreign and domestic terrorism. You can have hazardous failures or hacking, uh, failures that are related to uh, major systems being taken down, infrastructure systems. You can have fires that result from the same thing. You can have mass cases of groundwater contamination that makes it impossible to use water in your area. You can have major transportation accidents that hold up uh, traffics and highways. You can have structure and infrastructure failure, uh, natural gas lines, things of that sort. And you can have major accidents, uh, including mining explosions or accidents and explosions that happen subsequent to a terrorist event, if there are a multi-event scenario. So understanding all of the types of things that could potentially happen, then allows you to step back and think, huh, Am I prepared for these different scenarios? And what is the level of preparation that's happening at my dialysis center or at my transplant center where I get my care? Because you wanna have a plan. And again, as Ed has mentioned, you wanna make certain that the people who are caring for you have a plan and you know what your role is in it. What we're doing is flagging here that knowledge is power. And there's a tremendous amount of information that surrounds you when you're being proactive and planning for disasters and emergencies. Uh, there's 
that type of information that you use for ongoing awareness and for your own planning. And so there are state and federal advisories and warnings that you can sign up for uh, proactively uh, that warn you about major incidents that are related to terror. There are seasonal weather patterns that you should be aware of, hurricane season, and there are many different types of federal, state, and local alerts that you can sign up for that bring information directly to your cell phone or uh, to your laptop. Major utility problems, there are alerts that you can sign up for with the bills that you pay um, to your power and your gas and other types of uh, uh, vendors like that that will make you alert if something's going on. And then the other thing that we encourage people to do is think about what surrounds where you live and what surrounds where you get care. So for example, if your dialysis facility is near a railroad or highways or airports or waterways, be aware of that. Be aware that there could be an accident. Uh, that means you have to change where you might get your care. Other surrounding facilities, is there a nuclear power plant? Is there a major chemical plant? Start thinking in terms of, wow, I'm aware of the fact that there is that major potential hazard there. If something were to happen, am I ready? And then other sites, Ed, you might want to talk about this in terms of some of these things and how that factors into your planning. Sure. So thanks, Paul. The, if you live near a military base or a government building or high security technology centers, there, be aware that there are threats to those facilities and be aware of what their emergency responses are. If your centers are located near government buildings and you, you need to get to one and, and suddenly there's a threat against the building that's called in and they lock down the four block radius, which contains your dialysis center, your transplant center, what do you do? I mean, do you wait a day before they finish their investigation? Well, you should have a plan for that. You should know alternative sites that you can go to. You should know what's in the area and, and how it is that these installations respond to emergencies. What are the, what are the different levels of response? What does it mean? I mean, do they, for military bases, if you have to go on a military base for your, uh, treatment, it, do they lock down the gates? What, what happens to you? What, what does the hospital say on base? What's their procedure? And just be aware of what the plans are and they'll freely share, uh, things that involve your safety and your treatment because you factor into that when they're making those plans. And if you haven't factored in, you can make them aware that they need to factor you in. Thanks, Ed. And so if you, that's the ongoing awareness, just being alert to your surroundings, what's near you and what potentially could happen. And then there's a level of awareness that you can get that's immediate. For example, if something is to happen and there are great systems that are in place across the country, nationally, state and local, which are things like reverse 911 calls. What you can do is you can actually have your phone set up so that you're alerted in case obviously bad weather is coming, but also local government will alert you if there's a terror incident or another surprise type of natural incident. Social media reports, uh, you're on social media a lot, just go ahead and make certain that you have a site uh, that you trust uh, for your news uh, that alerts you when th changes are happening in your area. And then also, local media reports, uh, national and state media reports. So many of us get our news from so many different sources. Each one of those sources usually has a function where you can sign up for proactive messaging uh, for breaking news in your area. We encourage folks to do that. And the point of this whole thing is you don't wanna be finding out about something, quote, by accident or from somebody else when you have the power to get any information you need for planning right in your hand on your phone. Uh, the world is right. much different than it was 20 years ago. And it's interesting. So Paul and I, when I live in California and uh, we've had uh, earthquakes and wildfires and, and we're very close to where I live. And Paul, Paul and I, uh, when, when something like that happens, we, we go on uh, to the social media and we can actually track what the first responders are doing, where the threats are, and make our own assessments about what needs to be done and, and what sort of communicating we need to do with our AKP membership. And you have people who are dedicated to just going to these emergencies and, tra and tracking 
what the first responders are doing and publishing real-time information on a disaster. This road is closed. This is where you need to go to evacuate. This facility is open. Uh, the Red Cross is set up here. All of that is available to you and know who those people are who do that kind of reporting because they, they don't always use a, a, a logical name. I mean, sometimes you, they get creative with their, their handles and you have to figure out who it is and whether they're credible, but they're a great source of information. And it's funny, Paul, and I'm Paul's 3,000 miles away from me, but we're, when these things are going on, we're, we're in the exact same place uh, just, just because of the, the, the nature of the reporting. Yeah, thanks, Ed. Um, it's, anybody can do it. Uh, we encourage folks to do it and do it early so you're familiar with uh, the inf types of information that you can get. On the next slide, it's kind of an important lesson here. And we talk about this with uh, those who are involved in providing dialysis and transplant services, as well as patients uh, around the country that we work with, which is this. There is the ideal uh, emergency plan for yourself and for the facilities that you go to. And then there's that which is practical and actually sustainable. So a very easy way to think about this is simple is sophisticated, simple is sustainable, and simple is what is most easily recalled in an emergency. And before we get into the actual elements of your plan, it's important that you understand that managers, whether that's a emergency facility uh, manager or a local EMS responder or uh, civil uh, response manager, or if it's a dialysis facility manager, they are the people that have the responsibility for interacting and interfacing between the complex big notebook plan and what that actually means for you. And so they are trained to try to make certain that their communications outward to somebody like you uh, are very simple. And so you hear terms like shelter in place, that might be stay at the dialysis facility, don't try to go home, or stay in your home. Evacuation to a nearby location is a term of art. That means that the location has already been decided where people will be moved to and that it is known to local authorities that will we'll find the patients there, for example. Or evacuation and transportation routes, they're usually planned out well in advance, uh, and hopefully they are practiced. Ed will touch on that in a minute. But this is the type of simple communications that will come from those who are in charge of managing crisis response and getting a message out to you. You need to understand there's a lot more complex detail that comes behind that. So you should follow the directions when you get them you should know what it means. And with that, we always say uh, every plan should have the expectation of change. And that's why we work so diligently to make certain that uh, emergency facility managers and uh, care providers understand that any time a plan changes, that you are well aware of it and have been informed about it. Same thing for you. If you have an emergency plan where an element of it changes, you should let your loved ones and friends know that as well. Let's go ahead and take a look at the next slide here. And again, this is something that we encourage uh, those who are in the care facilities to do, and we encourage you to do it as well, which is broaden your circles and your networks, those who you could call upon for assistance. For example, for dialysis facility administrators or hospital administrators, we encourage them to have very strong relationships with local organizations like the United Way, the Boy Scouts, but also Ed and I come out of New England uh, off-road vehicle organizations, uh, four-wheelers that can provide transport, uh, fraternal organizations that have emergency shelter and emergency assistance, religious nonprofits play one of the most critical roles in any major disaster in the United States. They have a very long history in it. Make certain you know, based on your uh, spiritual beliefs or faith affiliations, what infrastructure exists or what volunteer organizations may exist for you. And then also media. You might want to find out who the local reporter is that handles different types of emergencies if you happen to be impacted, if you need to reach out and tell a story. Those are the types of things that uh, you have at your disposal to broaden out your circle beyond just your immediate family so that you have other resources to call upon and that the professionals who are taking care of you have additional people to call upon. Ed, anything else you want to reflect on this? Well, just just know your contacts. I know, and again, the 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 point 
is to do this before disaster strikes, because all of the all of these groups listed in in your community, and you may know others in your in your community. Make sure that you've touched base with them beforehand, so that they're aware of your interest, so that you can best protect your family, your friends, yourself. And uh, you, you may have more current information that can get out through the media, for for instance, and you can talk to. There'll be reporters on scene or reporters trying to get information, and you can be helpful in those instances, or, or through your the faith-based organizations that are that are there right away. So know know what they are and know who who it is to talk to, because it's just very important that you're not with a mob that just shows up at someone's doorstep. Have some understanding of how things work before it happens. So th this is critical, and it is exercise the plan. That's the, that's the the critical step in this. September is National Preparedness Month. Everyone in your facilities, the your your families, patients should all take time to review what your current plans are, uh, because it may show up as a notification that this is National Preparedness Month, and everyone can say great and then move into October. But what does that mean? It means that you have to take the time to review what the plan is and, and actually prepare. You have to develop scenarios for national, state, and local events. If you talk to the manager at your dialysis center to have them bring in an outside facilitator from the, the state or local government, the emergency response people, the fire chief, the, the, the police chief, just some government official who's responsible for the plan, they'll be happy to talk to you about this because it makes their lives easier when at least someone is aware of what they're doing. They'll tell you what they plan to do and how they operate. And understanding their structure is, is very important, but to re reach out to your, your facilities and say, hey, why don't we have a speaker come in? And if you call the local fire station and say, we'd like to have somebody talk, I assure you they'd be interested in, in pursuing that with you. So that's a very helpful interaction and, and it will make a difference in an emergency. There should be a designated person to observe what, what's going on, record problems and solutions. And that in and of itself, in the middle of a, of a crisis, it's very chaotic because it's a crisis. I mean, just by definition, a crisis is chaotic. And you have to have somebody understanding what exactly is going on. Someone who's not in the middle of everything, but just actually a recorder so that you can 10 minutes later look and say, okay, what, what's happening in this part of the neighborhood? What is it that we have to respond to? And what, what is it that we can do about that? Uh, and having that person in that position is, is critical because you'll be able to share real-time information with, with others who come in as well and give them a, a read back on what the situation is. And then when, once everything is settled down, do a post-event hot wash, which will be the good, the bad, and the ugly about what went on and how things can get better. And when you're in the middle of a, of a situation, you want to get to the other side of it. And once you're at the other side of it, you want to pick up on what lessons you learned and what you need to incorporate into your plan. So the next time something happens, you'll be, you'll be ready for, for that and you'll be better prepared for that. And then follow up with people who are involved in your plan and tell them how that plan has changed. So that there you're all operating on the same sheet of music. So these are some of the key questions that you should ask for the medical professionals. When was this plan created and does it still make sense? If you've got something from the seventies or, or even the early two thousands, what is different now? Well, I mean, there, there are a lot of things that are different. The modes of technology are different. The, the, the capacities are different. The, the different locations for evacuation have changed. Um, I'm certain of that. So make sure that you understand that and give them your professional opinion about whether it still makes sense. Ask yourself and ask them, what, what's your role in the plan? What happens in the first 72 hours when disaster strikes? Because uh, that's the most critical time period. It's very 
difficult to get resources deployed, full resources deployed during the first 72 hours. Eventually, depending on the scope of the disaster, there'll be some emergency response center set up, some official uh, FEMA stations, Red Cross stations, all of that. But in the first 72 hours, there'll just be pockets of that. And, and it's just, you, you have to know where to go and what to do for that critical period so that there's care and you're able to maintain uh, some, some level of care for the patients. And then ask yourself as you're looking at it, how does the plan work from a patient perspective? Does it make sense? Are they gonna have to walk three miles to, to get someplace? Well, you know, for, for somebody who's on dialysis and is, is 75 years old, that's not gonna work. So uh, how, do you, how do you get them there? What if the road is blocked? What if the bridge is washed out? What, what are those things that you have to deal with? And those are questions that you have to ask. And then similar to that is how does it work from the family caregiver perspective? The questions will be similar, but usually the family caregiver is responsible for the logistics and the solution. So you, you need to understand the, the issues that they're dealing with. And then you ask yourself, how do we reconstitute operations in the short term and reconstitute operations in the long term? Short term, you're going to, you're, you're going to be doing things in, in parking lots and in, in any other circumstance that you can get people who need dialysis that day or, or need medical care that day treated. That's your first priority. Longer term, you're going to be looking at other facilities that you can, you can set up if, if your facility was damaged or how do you repair your facility to get patients back in? What is it that you can do? And within your organizations, you'll have people who are responsible for making those plans. And, and those are the questions. What do we do? Hey, what, what happens if, this, if, if we get washed out? Where do we go? Uh, how do we get our patients there? And, and how do we get, what do we tell patients who have to come in? All of those things are important questions, um, both short-term and long-term. And then know who the federal and state contacts are. Uh, you would have somebody in your facility who at least has a list on where to start because there's, there's someone who, who has already hopefully done this drill and I'm, I'm fairly confident that that's occurred. But make sure they're current and know, know where they are. And uh, if you're, you're in a remote area, know that um, the, the, the people are, are tasked with your area of responsibility, know how they're gonna get there or what, whether they're gonna be accessible and how they're accessible. What do you do if the cell phones are down? I mean, how do you, how do you get in touch with them? What's the, um, is there a way to contact them by radio or, or shortwave radio or whatever it is? I mean, how, how, how does that work? And then again, the first responders uh, have plans for that as well. And then what, what are your community-based partner organizations? What is it that these folks do that are similar to what you do and how can you work together? And then critically is when, when is the last time that you exercise this plan? Like it was, was it after, after September 11th and, and for the next year you were running drills every three months in case something happened? Well, um, most of the people who, who did that probably aren't, aren't there anymore. So make, make sure that uh, you're, you've at least actively tested the plan once a year. Once every six months is good too, but once a year will certainly keep you fresh. So these questions are for patients and you yourself should ask, do I have an emergency preparedness plan? Is it, does it work for me? Does my kidney facility and care team have a plan? And I, I can say, I would think at least that they have something in place that they can show you, but if they don't push them and say, there should be something here because you never know what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. So why, why don't we have one? It's important to be prepared. And then have you been asked, how does your plan fit into the team's plan or the facility's plan? And make sure that you're both on the same page about that. If you're supposed to get yourself to a facility 
if normally the, the facility provides transportation there, you should know that so that you're not, you're not sitting there at a, at a certain time of day waiting for someone to come pick you up when in fact, no one's going to come and get you. And then you have to make arrangements with your team to, to make something happen. Check your, your contact information, your medication list, all of the, all of the personal information that you have to make sure that it's updated, it's most current, and it's not, it's not a few years old. Uh, what supplies you need to have on hand to, to handle both short-term and long-term emergencies. And, and we'll go through a little bit of the list later. There, there are also great federal and state resources which tell you what to have on hand, and your facility can help you with that as well. Does your medical team have your contact information? Do you have their contact information? Do you have 24 hour access to your team in the facility? I mean, if you're in a hurricane zone and the winds get over 50 miles an hour, the facility could shut down and say, for the sake of our employees, where we're not going to be open. Well, what do you do? Where do you go? How do you, how do you get treatment? Those are questions to ask. And then is there somebody who wouldn't be directly impacted by the, by the crisis, by the emergency that knows about your plan, somebody far away that at least can, can be aware of what it is that, that you're dealing with in, in the case of an emergency. And then, um, has anyone asked you for input on what your medical facilities are, what your team's plan is, and, uh, does that work for you? Because you're the patient and ultimately you're the one that it has to work for all this other stuff is. It's all well and good, but if it doesn't work for you, it doesn't amount to a hill of beans. So you, um, you want to make sure that if it doesn't work for you, you tell people why it doesn't work and figure out a way to make it work. And then, um, ask yourself this as, as you're sitting here listening to, to Paul and I, if something happened today or tomorrow, are you ready? Can you deal with it? What would you do? Would you have a plan in place that you could confidently say, if X happens, I'm going to do Y, or would you say, we're just going to have to wait and see, and then someone would come to me. And, uh, you know, just, just this winter here in California, we have a community no more than 30 miles from Big Bear and, uh, they got hit by a snowstorm in the mountains and it was a, a, a fairly rare event. I mean, it's not unforeseeable that a snowstorm would hit in the mountains, but it, with that level of snow that they received, they were snowed in for weeks and the, the, they didn't have the equipment in place on the, on the state or local level to plow the roads and nobody had a plan. Even the local emergency response people were, were overwhelmed. So ask yourself, you know, what, what would happen in, in that situation with you? What would you do? I mean, would you hike down the hill and, and adding to the complications was the, the roof caved in on the local grocery store. So getting groceries in was difficult as well. But anyway, ask yourself if something happened right now, today, when, when we finish this, uh, this session, what would you do? Are you ready? Thanks, Ed. So as Ed has been uh, walking through the different questions that you need to ask yourself, it gets down to the practicality of, okay, so what do you actually need to do? And it might sound daunting, but it's really not. Basically what you want to do is you want to be able to get core elements of a kit together. So you have uh, what you need in a crisis. You don't have to think twice about it. And all of this stuff can be done very easily in advance. So these are some of the top items on a checklist that you would want. Checklists are available from a number of sources. The ones that have been doing a fantastic job for the past 20, 25 years, the American Red Cross and the US Department of Homeland Security, specifically FEMA, have lists available that you can kind of curate for your own needs. But I think it's important as kidney patients that we think very, very practically about what are the minimum things that are necessary. So obviously your emergency contacts, it's more than one person. Uh, you need to have those, you need to have them updated and it needs to be multiple sources. So cell phone numbers, home addresses, uh, email addresses, those are the types of things that you need for each of your contacts. Uh, key medical data and who your contacts are. You might have multiple conditions as most of us do beyond kidney disease. 
So who are those experts and what is the in medical information that's required to treat all of your conditions? That should be very clearly written out. Uh, and again, we encourage folks not just to have it on your cell phone electronically, but also have it in hard copy. Prescription list, extra medications when you can get them, and most importantly, cash. Reason why we say cash is because typically in an emergency when the power is down, ATM machines are down, and most small businesses will go to a cash basis, uh, including sometimes groceries, and you cannot use your credit cards. So you need to start thinking, okay, uh, what type of cash? And what you wanna do is you wanna keep it single dollar bills uh, as much as you can. It may end up being a lot of them, relatively speaking, but it's better than having large bills that somebody else with very little cash has to make change for. Water and food for 72 hours. Uh, that is not only at your facility level, you should ask them if they are prepared for that, but also in your household. Um, and most importantly, pet plans. If you take a look at nearly every major disaster over the past several decades, one of the hesitancy is that is created when it comes to evacuating or sheltering in place is what happens to my pet. Now, the good news is that emergency managers have evolved in their thinking. And instead of trying to force people to leave pets behind, now there are usually accommodations if, if there's information in advance of an impending storm or something like that, where people can bring their pets. However, you need to have a plan for your pet, who would take care of it, who could come and pick it up and take it to a different location where it would be safe, will it have food and supplies? And then the real basics, flashlights. If you're dependent on your cell phone, you need extra batteries and extra chargers for that. A change of clothes, protective gear, that includes masks, gloves, comfortable shoes. You may be in areas or move to a facility that are not as hygienic as you would want them to be. You need to be able to protect yourself on that. And that ties in with sanitizers, hygiene supplies, and then some type of simple first aid kit to take care of small cuts um, and disinfectants that go with that, and also an emergency radio. Now, when you take a look at these things, you might think, wow, this is pretty daunting. But if you go onto the Red Cross website, or you can go onto Amazon, and you can see there are a number of different um, providers now that provide a basic pack. If you don't want to start your own, you can buy one that has basic elements to it and add to it. But the most important thing is you start collecting this. We recommend a backpack, which is portable, not just for you, but also if somebody else needed to carry it, um, it's all in one place and you just start putting it together with a checklist. This is from US Department of Homeland Security. It's very easily laid out. It's just a one sheeter that you can take with you to start asking questions and start thinking uh, with your family uh, and with your caregiver, what things you need to get ready for. You can take notes on it. Understanding that when you take action and prepare, you actually help everybody in your community. Because when you're a kidney patient, you're considered high need and high priority. But as Ed said, those first 72 hours can be very dicey. People may not get to you. So you can actually help first responders by making certain you can take care of yourself for 72 hours until they get to you. This is a huge, huge thing that we can't emphasize enough. Those first 72 hours, you may be on your own or you may be with a very limited medical staff at your facility. So do everything you can. You're part of a community. You have certain responsibilities. We encourage you to exercise those. So Ed has talked about uh, additional resources that are available. Uh, here are a number of them at the national level. Uh, one of the ones that we didn't mention is the uh, National Weather Service. They are absolutely fantastic. Uh, they have wireless emergency alerts as well. They literally have the latest information in the world. Um, the Centers for Disease Control does a very good job on the planning side and also on continuing education so you can learn more. You should have local contacts with the Kidney Community Emergency Response Team or CACER that's usually administered through the local networks. And we encourage you to make contact with them or find out what their uh, number is. Um, and then at the state level, every state is different. Most states have a state Department of Emergency Services or Homeland Security uh, and Public Safety that also make information available to you. Uh, Ed, you might wanna talk about this, the article that we did based on what you observed this winter in California. Sure, I, I alluded to it a little, little bit earlier. Um, 
the things that di dialysis patients need to be aware of and uh, public officials have to be informed about during the course of uh, inclement weather and the impact that it has. There, there are instances across the country where the local community isn't prepared for a disaster to strike. And uh, in this instance in California in Big Bear, their dialysis center was sending uh, its, its van up the mountain to collect patients to bring them down to the dialysis center. And they were being turned away at a checkpoint because they didn't have the proper clearance to go back up into the neighborhood. And there were a number of, of failures along those lines because the local public safety officials weren't aware that there were dialysis patients on the mountain. They weren't aware that the dialysis centers were actually bringing patients down the mountain and they didn't have any plan to get the people to a central location so that they could be taken to the dialysis facilities. And that, if you can imagine, panic sets in when that starts occurring. If you're up there and you're snowed in and another element to what you would want to have, and it's not very portable, is you want to have a generator. You also want to have a solar charger that will charge your generator and you can get solar panels to charge your cell phones as well. So as you're, you're putting your emergency kit together, you may not have access to traditional power where you can plug something in. So you want the, you want the chargers and you want the generator that will enable you to, uh, to power up your devices and you can throw it in the trunk of your car or whatever, but be prepared there. But Paul and I uh, wrote this article specifically because we observed some, some of the issues that, that were encountered. And this is in a community that, that should have been better prepared and they just didn't think about it. And uh, they didn't have the equipment to plow the roads because the snow was too deep. And so they had to bring it in from other states and it delayed the responses and um, jeopardized people's lives. So read, read through this, you'll find a lot of information. It's a, you, you can see the link there. It's, it's available online. And um, I think there's a lot of lessons to learn there. And I assure you that the San Bernardino County of Emergency Services Office is going through some checklists now on what it is that they need to do. And um, one, one of the things that the patients were hearing every day as they were sitting there in their freezing cold houses was, we're, we're handling the situation as best we can and we ask you to be patient. Well, as, as kidney patients, I don't know, um, there, you, ha you have a different sense of urgency than, than just somebody who's up there enjoying the, the mountain snow. And you want to make sure that your local emergency responders are, are aware of that sense of urgency. Well, thank you all for, for listening to Paul and I. We, we enjoy these presentations. Uh, we think that it's very important that you as, as kidney patients are take responsibility mm. for developing the emergency plans and asking the questions of the appropriate people. And we will uh, update our site throughout the year and, and make communications available to you as kidney patients um, and as uh, care providers that we find helpful for emergency responses. So th thank you for joining us, Diana. I, uh, I turn it back over to you. Paul, any, any last words? No, we just, uh, we've seen a lot over the years, Ed, and I think the number one goal, I think you hammered it right down, is we each have our own responsibility. And if you think the Calvary is coming on the day of an event, it's likely not. Okay, so okay. we pray, okay. pray hard, work hard with the folks that are responsible for that, but you need to take care of yourself. So good working right. with you. Well, thank you very much for joining us. I turn it over to our executive director, Diana Kleins. Thank you both. This was such an important topic. And as you said, no matter where we live, we must all remember that emergencies come in all forms and no one is excluded from a potential situation. Being proactive is key. Now, I'd like to welcome two individuals who have firsthand experience putting a plan into action. Mr. Angel Rivera, a current hemodialysis patient from St. Croix, Virgin Islands, and Ms. Amina Salif, former care partner of her husband, who was a hemodialysis patient 
residing in St. Croix, Virgin Islands as well. In 2017, the Virgin Islands were devastated by hurricanes. Since that time, St. Croix has struggled to stabilize dialysis operations on the island. So much so that approximately 40 dialysis patients cannot return to their homes for lack of open dialysis chairs. I thank Angel and Amina for joining us so we can learn more about the area's current situation, what is being done to help the patients of St. Croix, and lessons learned that both Angel and Amina want fellow patients and care partners to know to proactively protect themselves in the event of an emergency. Angel and Amina, welcome. To begin, I'd like to ask, in response to the devastation of St. Croix, can you both share with us a bit about the, con- the creation of the Virgin Islands Healthcare Foundation? Yes, thank you, Diana, for having us. When we got hit by two Cat 5s in 2017 by Irma, um, Maria, Hurricane Irma and Maria, it was unbelievable. We had no idea that such a thing could happen when both of our islands were devastated um, and had no resources. But when people think about what happens to dialysis patients, it's really different especially here in the Virgin Islands, we can't drive to another city or town to get dialysis. And so when our patients, what had to happen was that they had to fly off island. And since this had never happened before, it was something that neither FEMA and all the people here to assist really had done before. So coordinating about 100 patients to fly off island, going to all places in the United States where they could find space was really confusing. It was difficult. It was difficult for the patients. It was difficult for the caregivers. And it was difficult for the doctors who took care of those um, patients. And so the Healthcare Foundation was formed afterwards because we realized that there needed to be more support for patients um, and their families than just the government that provides the dialysis here. We needed to be able to um, maybe raise funds, do things that could stay in connection with these patients if they had to go off island. We needed to be able to be connected with them if they had difficulties. Um, A nonprofit could raise funds and raise money. So there's that money to support. People forget about dialysis patients, but they are one of your most vulnerable people in your community because they have to have their services three times a week. And so the Healthcare Foundation concentrates, one of our biggest concentration is dialysis patients. And as we learned from the previous presentation, it's important to be prepared as an individual, but how important is it for the dialysis facilities to have a plan in place and be coordinated with community responders in their efforts to support and or evacuate patients as necessary in emergency situations? Wow, Uh, that's a a kind of a a loaded question. I think, Angel, do you have some ideas on how to explain that? Uh, It is a bit of a loaded question because it falls more in the governor and the government to um, to put those those processes in place. As dialysis patients, we 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 only show up for our treatment, and to control that part of it is very difficult. It is a lot of anxiety when we hear a storm is coming, or when there is um, you know some kind of inclement weather that's that's around, uh, but it. It normally falls more on the on the government or the facility um, managers, really, to um, to let us know what are their plans. Yes, and and with that, that's another reason that the foundation was formed, because we wanted to have a more intimate relationship with these patients, um, so that we know um, their caregivers where they live, that we have a plan that if a disaster ever happens again, 
that we know where each patient lives um, by having, you know, um, contact with them with their tablets and telemedicine so they can contact us. We wanted to know who their caregiver were and that we wanted to be able to, so we have meetings with them and their caregivers. And we also wanted to be able to have a list that when we do, if they did have to go off island again, and we're hoping we're working towards having a facility that they will not have to ever happen again, but if they did have to go off, off island again, they don't go off island with paper files like what they went before, that they have electronic records that are going to be following them to whatever facility they have. And so coordination with the government and all of the, and FEMA and everyone who was doing these plans is real important. That happened this year. Um, they started that. They started to really look, the government has started to look at what is going to happen. They have a plan right now, but because our facility is not open, we're not in that plan, but some of the patients that we are going to have are in that plan. And when we open our facility, um, it's important for us to be a big part of that plan. So that, like I said, our special needs patients from the day before we will be contacting them on what they're supposed to be doing. Those who have to be dialyzed the next day, making arrangements for them. So it's an important factor that everyone work together. And we learned a lot from this storm. How would you both suggest patients and care partners approach facilities to understand the plan that they have in place? And if a satisfactory answer is not provided, the importance of demanding that preparations are proactively made? Well, I would answer that in the sense, and then I, I was a caregiver for many years, and um, and Angel is a patient. So as a caregiver, I found out that when my husband went on dialysis, um, that they're they're so vulnerable, they're so weak that they can't even advocate for themselves. And so it was important to try to get the caregivers to do that advocating that for the needs of these patients. And a lot of people don't understand what their needs are. And so it's important to have your, to, to kind of get everyone together, but to not forget the caregivers. They're the most important. They know their, their person better than anybody else and they are able to, to move around, to get involved, to, to talk to the um, facilities, to talk to those emergency care people and say, this is what their needs are. This is what, um, how they are. They had this problem before, you need to avoid that. They are such a wealth of information for patients that I think sometimes they're, um, eliminated because if you have a list of patients, um, you don't have a list of caregivers also, and you need to have that. Each person needs to have that person there, and they and their caregivers need to be strong. And we're we're going to be working with all of our caregivers in the foundation to be the advocates for dialysis and for um, kidney patients, and and how. Yes, that is that is true. The caregivers play a very important role in um, in the care and treatment of, of dialysis patients. Um, I have seen it myself um, with many patients where the caregivers are the ones who remember uh, medications, who remember you know treatment times, what what a patient did uh, previously, or what could have caused a problem. Um, a lot of times, the nurses are the ones that talk to the caregivers and explain to them in, and give them the information of how the treatment went, which is very important to have that extra person there, that extra ear, uh, you know, to make sure that everything goes well. Uh, I know in the past, after the hurricane, uh, I was not flown out, but I know many patients have told me stories where they got flown out and it wasn't weeks after that their family member, their wife, who is their caregiver, had to find their own way to meet up with that patient, whatever state they were in, and they had to pay their own way. That that's something that you know we really don't want to happen again. And caregivers play a very very important role in the treatment. I mean, you might be home in bed 
sleeping and you might have an issue with your access, your caregiver is the one that's your eyes, you know, while you're sleeping, while you're resting. And it, it happened. It, it does happen. And finally, personally speaking, what did you learn going through this situation that you both can share with fellow patients and care partners in other areas that are prone for extreme weather events, like Florida, which also faces hurricanes, California that contends with wildfires, and the northern states that can be severely impacted by ice and snowstorms? Well, I know what I learned from many of my friends and people I knew who were, um, who were displaced during our storm. And, and something we never thought about before is that every family who has a dialysis patient needs to have their own emergency plan. They have to have, know exactly, well, what's going to happen if the storm hits today? Where is my husband going or son going tomorrow? for his dialysis and and what can I do if we can't get out? They have to have their own plan. They have to be asking those questions now, not when the storm hits, not even when people are scurrying around preparing for a storm. They need to know now what's gonna happen. How is it, How are we gonna handle this? What do I need to have ready for them? Can, can we, if we have to leave this area because there's no place, can we go to an area where we have family? Can you transport us there? Can I go with him or someone else go with them so they could be their eyes and ears? Um, when a person comes off of dialysis, they are weak. And if they're already traumatized from a storm and worrying about everything. They need that person with them. So besides the state having a plan and your city having a plan and your dialysis center having a plan, a family has to have a plan. They have to know all the things that are necessary. They might have to have, um, they need to know that their diets during that period of time, this is not the time to cheat mm -hmm. and eat things you shouldn't eat. Um, you have to keep them on their diet. You, all of these things are important. And so uh, having a family plan for your patient, for your loved one, is really important and finding out all the things that are possibility, knowing what the plans are, the state is having, the city has and whatever. So you're not shocked. You're not get phone numbers, having a list of phone numbers of who to call, having talked to your doctor about what will happen with them and then knowing some other things that you might be able to do. And, and how is the patient? Yes. And I can speak to that too. Uh, it's very important also to have a family, a family member, uh, whether it be a brother, uncle, a sister, whoever it is, someone else, because the caregiver sometimes can do it all on their own. And if you have your home to protect, that is a big issue, especially being in um, where we at in the islands, we're very limited. And it would apply to anyone else in Florida if you have to get up and leave, you need to be prepared. You need to have uh, um, all the documents in place. Everything needs to be set up, but you also need help from friends. If you have very good friends, make sure to come by and check you. I mean, friends isn't just a drinking buddy or going and partying. A friend is someone that's there with you. Even when you don't think you need them, they're checking on you. And that's very important that that you have that that um, that little um, um, relationship with your very close friends, right? And and as Danielle said, that support system because your caregiver needs a support system yeah. also. And something else he said is that yeah, if you have to get up and leave. Who's going to watch your house? Who's going to make sure everything is going there? That's in your plan. Who's your backup when you have to leave? Who's taking care of your house? Who's taking care of your, your, you know, your bills? Your, your, all the things like that. So the most important thing that I think we would want to tell people who are now getting into this thing of preparing, that one is to have your own family plan yeah. and get that plan ready. And, and to also understand there's the psychological side of, of, of this all. Um, we all consider that we have hurricane PTSD. As soon as the storm starts, you know, hurricane season comes around, 
It's that nervous jitter. So also looking for some help, some mental health um, assistance. You might want to get a, a therapist during that period of time just to talk to and let them hear what you're saying and how you're feeling and have them talk to your loved one. So because it's a period of time that is always when as soon as hurricane season happens or as soon as you hear there may be a wildfire or anything, you're always going to be remembering what happened the last time. So in your plan, also put in your support system and some mental health assistance. One other thing too, um, for dialysis patients, don't ever forget, tell your loved ones, especially your caregiver, thank you. Because they play a very, very important role in your well-being. So you have to be there for the, your caretakers also. Not only, you know, it's you are the primary, but they're human too, and they need, they need that support. A simple thing as thank you, you know, I appreciate what you do, goes a long way. Thank you, Angel and Amiha. We appreciate you having the courage to talk about your experiences and help fellow patients and care partners prepare as best as possible for an emergency situation they may one day face. To close the session, I'd like to thank all of our speakers. I hope the information and lessons learned that we share today encourage you to take a few moments to review your personal emergency preparedness plan and ask the tough question, but critical questions of your dialysis facility. What preparations do they have in place?